Hello, my name is Dan and welcome to my first impressions and setup video of the Snow Peak Vault Dome Tent in Ivory. In this video, I will go over some of my thoughts about what I like about this tent and what I wish it did a little better. As an avid camper, I'm always looking to YouTube for buying advice and reviews, so I hope that this video helps you in your search for your next tent. As a disclaimer, we purchased this tent on our own and this video is not sponsored by Snow Peak. However, if you'd like to check it out and also support this channel, an affiliate link is provided in the description below. This is a four person tent that I think is suitable for three and a half seasons. Its seasonality is dependent on your cold tolerance, but I'm used to sleeping inside a three season tent in freezing temperatures, so your mileage may vary. The outer fly sheet is made out of 75D polyester taffeta. Taffeta is a woven type of polyester fabric that feels durable yet is easy to manipulate. With a polyurethane coating made to withstand 1800 millimeters of head pressure, which is about 1.4 PSI, it is considered very waterproof. The fly also has a form of UV processing to keep it from fading in the sun, which is good. The inner tent is made out of 68D polyester taffeta, with the bottom made out of a more durable 210D polyester Oxford fabric. It features the same 1800mm polyurethane waterproofing and tape seams on the floor. Whether the floor can withstand heavy rain with people walking around inside of it is still something we will have to see. In terms of wind resistance, the tent held up very well as the inner tent can be completely sealed keeping away cold drafts at night. During some decent gusts, the fabric looked and felt strong, the only weak points being the included stakes, which I'll get to later, but they can always be upgraded. The packed weight is 20 pounds and fully built is 17 and a half feet long, 9.8 feet wide, and 4.9 feet tall. As a five foot nine person, it was tall enough for me to stand and change inside of, but wouldn't say it's as comfortable as being able to stand up straight. Fully packed, the tent bag is approximately 28 inches long, 12 inches wide, and about eight and a half inches tall, resulting in a somewhat mushy and rectangular shape. We didn't have to fight the bag when it came to storage. It's easy to pack into, easy to carry, and easy to stow. Considering the material choice, size, and weight, this is definitely a car camping tent. The tent does not come with a footprint, but they do have it available as an option along with an indoor tent mat. Now I'm going to display for you our real-time setup and teardown. Hopefully this gives you an idea of how long it might take for you when setting it up for the first time following the directions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a progress bar. If you want to skip to either the teardown or final thoughts, use YouTube's chapter feature on the bottom left corner to do so. All right, here we go. Taking out the tent. Trying to find the orientation of the tent. Where I'm holding the tent would be where the front vestibule is, so it's where the front entrance would be. As you can see, it's pretty long, so you want to pay attention to your pad size at the campground. I believe the stakes are made out of stainless steel. They felt very sturdy and strong. In the instruction booklet, it does tell you when you are folding them up to fold them up from the middle so as not to over stretch the elastic inside of it. With two people, this process goes a lot faster. 
the poles being so long and slightly curved, I could imagine that if you're setting this up by yourself, it might take you a little bit longer. I know sleeves are a limitation of a tent this large and this tall. It's so that the ceiling can stay high without you having to somehow reach over and clip it in. However, I don't quite know how I feel about it. To me, it's so much simpler to clip in a fly into the poles, but it is what it is and you just have to work with, if you want lots of headroom, most likely you're gonna have to deal with a sleeve. We left the guy lies on from last night, so it started getting a little tangled within the poles, but not a big deal. We just spent a little bit of time trying to center the poles within the sleeve. The best way to figure that out is the color portion should stay within the sleeve. This is where having two people helps out a lot so that one person can feed and push the pole through while the other makes sure the sleeve isn't getting caught within the fold. And because the sleeve is so long, it does take a little bit of time to make sure the pole comes out the other end without any kind of snagging. Or sometimes the fabric can even get pinched as the pole gets pushed and pulled, revealing the elastic in between. So you just want to make sure none of the fabric is being caught within that pinch. Here we are setting up our third and final pole. As you can see, the yellow poles go on the front and rear, and the red pole, the longest pole, goes in the middle. I'm just fixing one of the clips that I've accidentally undone. This tent is unique in that it can interface with another vault tent in order to make one very, very long 35 foot long tent. In that event, you would unclip the bottom from the front vestibule and there are strap-in points so that you can connect it with the front of another vault tent's vestibule. It's a pretty cool feature if you're in a large group camp However, your pad size would have to be fairly long in order to accommodate a 35 foot long tent. As you will see later though, if you had two tents with the vestibules connected, you would have a fairly ample space in between and there is a side door provided in that vestibule for entry and exit. Really smart design.
The pole gets its shape from the tension uh, within the tent and there are these clips uh, or I would say pins that you insert into either end of those hollow poles which the tension of the tent fabric itself bends the poles and gives it a shape. I'm just making sure none of the guy lines are oh, tangled. This is a slightly awkward portion of the tent setup where you have all the poles sure. in and yet they are not freestanding yet. So they want to fall in either direction. We haven't quite figured out which way is the most efficient when you're trying to move around this much fabric. We just let it fall whichever way it wanted to and just start it from the back end. I'm right now getting the six and the hammer slash mallet slash axe that I have. At this point, I'm hoping the ground is a bit softer than the upper lot of Texas Springs, but as I will soon find out, it is not. At this point, I'm getting slightly frustrated, so I'm going to get my axe so I can beat the stakes a little bit harder. Again, if you were setting up into softer soil and you're camping in the forest, for example, this portion of the setup would go for you much, much quicker. I'm intentionally not fast forwarding this part of the video so you can see how much we had to struggle with this type of ground soil. The night before the wind picked Dude. up Seriously? only during the night so knowing that we are staying here one more night I'm trying to be very diligent in making sure these stakes have some kind of purchase in the soil it's just like hitting straight I'm glad we did because or it's like this, this very evening so the wind picked up and I didn't have to worry about the tent flying away
The ground was so tough that I would hit rocks and start bending the tips of the stakes as well as the heads. So here I am trying to loosen it up. A trick I found out was you can take some water and pour it over the portion of the ground that you're trying to hammer into, which might loosen up the soil. But in this instance, I felt like we were just hitting rock. Do you have any tips for hammering into hard soil? I would love to hear it in the comments below. If you have a suggestion and it's a good one, I'll make sure to feature it in the next camping video. So the way this tent goes up is you first stake down one side of the tent, whether it's the front or the rear, and then you grab the other side and you pull it to give it tension and shape. So it's important that you get the front two and the rear two stakes pulling tightly on the tent or else the middle portion of the tent where the inner tent resides will sag and the fabric will buff it against the inner tent, which is not the best. There's a little bit of a trick because if you feel, pull the tent too tight, it might over tension the inner tent which clips to the outer tent, which we found out later. You want to get it just right. And I feel like the more you set it up, the better you're going to know what that ideal tension might feel like. And as we get this fourth stake down, we're going to end the setup video right here because the rest of it is just making sure your guy lines are staked and tight. And here we are about to move to the inner tent setup. Here we go with the inner tent setup portion of this video. You're currently looking through the front vestibule entrance all the way back to the rear. So notice that there is also a rear entrance. We did not get the specially made ground or footprint made for this tent. So I brought a random tarp that I hope would fit. But as you can see, it is very undersized. The instructions say uh, when you're filling up the inner tent to put the logo towards the front vestibule. So right now I'm searching for the front logo. Once I have the inner tent oriented in the correct direction, the setup goes pretty quickly. There are only about 14 clips, seven on each side that clip to the structure of the outer tent or the fly. It's just a matter of clipping them in, they line up really easily and the setup goes much quicker than the outer tent. Notice the small snow peak logo towards the bottom right. I unclip here real quickly because I was moving too fast on my side, which made yes. clipping in the bottom floor of the tent a little bit more difficult. That alludes to what I spoke about earlier about over tensioning the outer tent, which might make your inner tent feel a little too stretched out. So later on, I went back and loosened up a little bit of the tension of the outer tent to not stress the inner tent so much. And that's pretty much it. 
After a few clips, the door is ready to fold out and the inner tent is ready to go. I will say the clips and the toggles are really easy to use and very user friendly. Here we go with the packing up of the tent. This is from the prior day when we had to move our campsite. So going in reverse, we first start by unclipping the inner tent from the outer tent. You can see that the inner tent has an excellent seal against just air in general. So in a windy night, like we had the night before and the night after, it did a really good job of keeping the cold drafts out of the tent to where we didn't have to rely on our sleeping bags as much to stay warm. This is the primary reason why I think this tent makes for a decent three and a half season tent because of its ability to seal the inner tent completely off from the wind. Mm -hmm. Now during the hotter seasons, you can definitely open up both sides of the inner tent and you get a surprising amount of airflow going through the tent. Here we're trying to figure out, should we fold into thirds from where we are or should we folded in from the outside in. So what we settled on is that we fold it in half first and then fold it half in on one side, half in on the other side, essentially reducing the side by half and then we can fold it in half again so that all the edges aren't exposed. As long as the inner tent folds into a rough square shape that's about the length of the stakes when they're folded up, or I should say the poles when they're folded up, it should be fine. So this is a huge advantage of a tent that is made in this style is that if it is raining outside or if there are high winds like what we experience, you can pretty much pack out your inner tent along with all of your gear, set that aside, uh, and when you're ready to go, you can take it out of your tent and put it into your car. And at that point, you only have to worry about breaking down the shelter. It's really convenient in keeping your inner tent free of water and possibly mold and mildew. Once the inner tent has been squared away, we go back to the outer tent and make sure everything is zipped back up. As you can see, all the zipper seams have a little cover on the outside held in place with Velcro. Make sure that even with winds that rain doesn't seep in through your zipper seams. And as you can imagine, the teardown process goes a little bit quicker because all you have to do is really pull out the stakes and fold it back into itself. Everything is easier with two people, whether you're packing up or setting up. So my partner Kaya is following behind me, gathering the stakes, putting it into the bag so that I can have both my hands free so that I can use my mallet's handle, get it underneath the stakes against the ground and have an easy pull every time. I must have had some trouble here pulling out one of the stakes. Perhaps it was a little too close to the ground for my mallet's handle to get underneath. So I apologize for the lengthy 
nothingness. But we'll come around soon. While we wait here, I want to know, are you enjoying this type of video? I know something like this is something that I've never seen. So, you know, if I can make a video, I want to make something that I'd want to watch. And a lot of times I wonder how exactly long does it take to set up and pack down a tent? So I hope this long form type of review video is useful for you. If not, if there's any way I can make it more efficient or more detailed or more useful for you, please leave me a suggestion in the comments below. The mallet in my hand is one of those cheap five, six dollar plastic mallets from REI. My personal opinion is that it's really not worth it unless you are driving stakes into the softest ground. The plastic does not feel very good in the hand, especially when you're hitting it, it against something very hard. It just sends all the vibrations straight down the mallet into your hand. Not a pleasant experience. We are not in a big rush when packing this tent down, but there are 12 stakes and tie down points, so keep that in mind. For the sake of time, we didn't even use all the guidelines made available to us. We probably left four of them out, and so we used eight total. I was getting really frustrated hammering stuff into this ground, so I didn't bother with the rest. The tent held up fine, though. Again, here's some of the awkwardness with the size of this tent and the way the poles interact with the fabric. They're gonna wanna fall whether to towards the front or the back. We just kind of let it fall wherever it wants. It's not that hard to straighten that out after anyway. Here's me reminding ourselves that when you fold the poles in, they should be folded in starting from the center. At least that's what the instruction book says. I believe it's because if you start from one end, you might run out of slack by the time you reach the other side and you might end up ripping the inner elastic cord. This part might feel slow, but you know what? This is the relaxed pace at which we usually set up and pack down our tents. We're not really in a rush. We're not trying to set a new record. 
We're really not trying to show you the fastest possible way you can set this tent up. We hope that this represents what a typical setup and pack down might look like for you. Here's me figuring out that the vestibule has a clip in the tensioning strap underneath and I unclipped it um, by accident. Uh, I didn't really need to. The only time you would have to do that is if you are connecting two vestibules or two tents together. You really want to keep that locked in. It's not a big deal. When they set it up later on this day, uh, super easy to clip back together. So keep in mind, this is our very first time using this tent. So we're trying to figure out and remember how the tent was packed inside. What we found to work is we fold the tent in half. So in my left hand is the very peak or the top of the tent. We let all the hardware and straps fall to one side. We then take the front and rear entry points out and fold them in to make a sort of a rectangle. We can then grab each of the corners and do a little hot dog fold. In this part, you can fold it however you like. Basically, the width of it is now about the width of the poles as they're folded and we folded it in thirds because ultimately this outer shell will roll up into a tube that will then be wrapped by the inner tent but we found the bag to be fairly forgiving in terms of how well it's packed just make sure it's compressed and the length does not exceed the length of the folded poles. I'm gonna speed you up through this section mostly because we were really trying to carefully pack it the way we found it. But later on we found out that the bag is much more forgiving. Once we burrito rolled the 
outer tent inside of the inner tent. Just slide it back into the bag and it's good to go. And that was it. If you made it this far in the video, I congratulate you. But it fits. That was a real time, very thorough review of the setup and pack down process. And now for my final thoughts. Here are five annoying, five amazing things about this tent. Number one, not enough attachment points in the inner tent. There are only two. So we hung a line in between two of them so that we can hang our tent light in the center. Number two, wind buffeting noise is unavoidable with this much fabric and it's not the quietest tent in heavy winds. Here's a sample. Number three, the guy lines are invisible out in the desert sun and moon. The white color without any reflective tape means it's a constant tripping hazard. Buy your own reflective guy lines is our advice. Number four, the supplied stakes are flimsy and weak and not suitable for hard packed ground. We bent a few trying to hammer them in into rocky soil. We recommend upgrading them. Number five, tension. It's hard to gauge how much tension you need for the outer tent until you set it up, but we think you'll nail it with time and practice. So those are five annoyances we found with the tent. However, they quickly fade into the background because the tent also features some strong benefits in its design and construction. Number one, it has strong and durable construction with what seems like trustworthy seams and waterproof fabric. Not too lightweight and not too bulky either. It's just right. Number two, ease of the setup and pack down. The weight and packaging of the tent fits easily into cars without much bulk. Number three, the outer tent being a freestanding shelter gives you a ton of options in how you want to use it. Perfect for beach days or hot summer nights. It easily stores all your gear and separates it from the outer elements. Number four, the vestibule is amazing for shelter from the sun during the day. You also have two options for entry and exit from the vestibule that leads to the inner tent. The main awning entrance and the side entrance it's truly a remarkable design. Number five, the inner tent has two large openings featuring mesh doors that can also be completely sealed from the inside. We have yet to see what this means in terms of condensation as we haven't seen it in our nights out in the desert. However, during windy nights, we appreciated the noticeable lack of wind drafts. It kept us nice and toasty inside. So there you have it. Five annoyances and five major benefits of the Snow Peak Vault tent. We hope you enjoyed this exhaustive video and found it helpful. If you want to see more videos like this and want to support our channel, it would mean the world to us if you left us a comment, like this video, and subscribe to this channel. We hope that our videos can fill a niche in the YouTube community for you. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.